Go ahead and grab a seat. We uh, have experienced worship this morning. Amen? Amen. Amen. And listen to me. I I pray that what you just sang, that you experienced this week, that in the presence of Jesus, you experience the kind of peace that just leads you to know deep in your soul, it is well because Jesus is with me and I am with Jesus. Hey, we're talking uh, today, uh, entering into a new sermon series, and we're going to be talking about moving out of comfort zones into compassion. Now, the minute I say that, it reminds me of some sayings that we're all familiar with. I mean, we've all heard the saying, it's easier said than done. And when it comes to moving out of our comfort zone, uh, just just into anything, that's easier said than done. Especially into showing compassion for others, way, way, way easier said than done. Uh, We've heard the phrase, talk is cheap, and we know that. Uh, Kind of the idea is there are just certain things in life, and I want you to answer me on this one. Do you agree or not? Uh, Just so many things in life uh, where it's easier to talk about than it is to do. Can we all agree on that? There's a lot of things that we talk about that's just harder to do, right? Uh, Let me give you an example. Uh, For Kim and me, it is cleaning out our attic, I mean, we've been in that house since 1999. We've raised three kids in that house. Uh, We've had all three of those kids who have moved out and moved back and moved out and moved back. And uh, and they've all three left some stuff behind. And uh, but but I can't really blame them. The truth is, Kim and I have done a pretty good job of filling up our attic on our own. I mean, our oldest is 37 years old, and I got to admit something to you. In our attic, we We have a 37-year-old baby bed that we bought when she was born. Why do we have it, you say? Well, because you never know when somebody may need a 37-year-old baby bed. Amen? So consequently, Kim and I talk a lot about we need to clean out our attic, and then consequently, we, we never seem to do it. We even, you know, this is how bad it's gotten. One day, we tried to motivate ourselves. I'm sure Kim's the one that did this, not me. And, and she said, you know, we've got to clean out the attic. I mean, one of these days, we're going to die, and we can't leave that for our kids to do, right? I know, that's kind of gross, isn't it? Now, now here's, here's the thing I want you to think about with me for a second. Why is it that we've not cleaned out our attic? We've been talking about it for several years now. I'm not joking. I would suggest to you the reason is because we much prefer a comfortable Saturday to getting up there on our Saturday and working and sweating and getting dirty and nasty and trying to figure out what we're going to throw away and what we're going to keep. And besides, and you can relate to this, right? In the wintertime in the attic, it's too cold. Of course it is. In the summertime in the attic, it's too hot. And then when it's really pretty outside, it's too pretty outside to get up in the attic. And so we just keep talking about it and never doing it. Now, here's the thing I want you to understand when it comes to comfort zones. The problem with just hunkering down in our comfort zone, not just when it comes to cleaning out an attic, but when it comes to every area of our life, The problem is Jesus didn't call you or me to a life of comfort. The invitation of Jesus is not chill. It's not get comfortable. It's not chillax. See, the invitation of Jesus really is follow me. And the reality is we can't follow Jesus and hang out in our comfort zone all at the same time. And by the way, when you look to Jesus, he really did model for us this life of moving out of his comfort zone into showing compassion 
for others. Go no further than the Garden of Gethsemane. He's in the Garden of Gethsemane and he's praying, Father, if it's possible, let this cut pass from me. What is he saying? He's saying, Father, walking to the cross doesn't sound nearly as comfortable as walking away from the cross. Father, the cross doesn't look all that comfortable or inviting. So if it's possible, could you just let this cut pass from me? But then he comes back and he prays what? Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. Now, when Jesus chose to walk to the cross instead of walking away from the cross, he was choosing to walk out of his comfort zone there in the garden to demonstrate compassion for every single human being on this planet because it was there on the cross that he accomplished salvation for us. And here's the thing I want you to get, and I'm gonna end the sermon kind of with this very point, so I want you to pay attention. Uh, I'm just kind of foreshadowing where we're going with this. It was in stepping out of his comfort zone, not in hanging in his comfort zone, but stepping out and demonstrating compassion for others that Jesus experienced joy in his father. Father. It's for the joy that was set before him that he endured the cross. Joy is found in showing compassion, not in seeking our comfort. I really believe the reason so many people who say, I am a Christian, I am a follower of Jesus, I have experienced new birth in Jesus, are restless in their faith and not satisfied in Jesus and cannot sing with integrity in their heart, it is well, it is well, it is well in my soul. The reason so many don't find Peace in the presence of Jesus is not because Jesus is defective or because faith is flawed, but it's because we, and I'm including myself in this, far too often pray when it comes to moving from a comfort zone into a, com a place of compassion for others, we pray not your will, but my will be done. And it robs us of our joy and our peace, and our contentment in Jesus. As a matter of fact, let me say it like this. When we choose our comfort zone over following Jesus, we very soon find ourselves uncomfortable in the presence of Jesus. Because we know Jesus is calling us to something uh, that we're not gonna do, that we're not willing to follow him in. And so then we start turning away from Jesus and not experiencing the pre presence of Jesus or the peace of Jesus or the power of Jesus working in our lives. Comfortable, comfort zones rather, are comfortable, but they don't give us joy. And claiming to follow Jesus while pursuing our comfort doesn't work. And let me say it again, you can't stay in your comfort zone and follow Jesus. So we're starting a sermon series today. Comfort to compassion. And in every sermon, what we're gonna be inviting you to do, begging you to do, challenging you to do, encouraging you to do, is to not just let this series go in one ear and out the other, but we're gonna invite you, encourage you, beg you to take a step out of your comfort zone in every one of these series, the sermons in this series, into demonstrating compassion for others. Today, specifically, we're gonna talk about demonstrating compassion for for those who are hurting. And let me say it again. We want you to do this. We're encouraging you to do this because it is not in our comfort zone that we find joy and peace and power and we see the spirit of God working in us and through us. It's not in our comfort zone that we experience abundant life in Jesus. It is when we step out of our comfort zone and follow Jesus into showing compassion for others. And specifically today, we'll look at Compassion for those who are hurting. Our text is gonna be right out of the Gospel of Matthew. And the story is the story of the feeding of the 5,000. 
But I'm not really preaching on the feeding of the 5,000. I'm preaching on the first two verses that introduces the story. Matthew chapter 14, verses 13 through 14. And I'm gonna ask you, it's a very short passage. I'm gonna ask you to stand and I'm gonna ask you to read this text with me and we're standing to declare that we are about to be speaking not the words of man, but the word of God. And we are saying, Lord, speak for your servants listen. Will you read with me? Now, when Jesus heard this, he withdrew from there in a boat to a desolate place by himself. But when the crowds heard it, they followed him on foot from the towns. When he went ashore, he saw a great crowd and he had compassion on them and healed their sick. Amen. God bless you. Go ahead and grab a seat and let's just dive into this text together. Here's, here's what I want you to get. I'd love for you to just get this thought in your mind this next week when you're confronted with somebody who's hurting and you're in your comfort zone and, and you sense the Spirit of God is calling you to step out of your comfort zone uh, to demonstrate compassion for somebody who's hurting. Just remember this, compassion prioritizes others' pain over our comfort. You have that opportunity. I just pray that you just repeat that just like a mantra. Hey, right now I've got a choice and compassion prioritizes this person's pain over my comfort. Jesus demonstrated compassion to those who were hurting. And in our heart, in your heart, in my heart, I'm going to guess that every one of us sees ourselves in our heart as people who are compassionate toward those who are hurting. I really see myself that way. I really believe I'm compassionate toward the people who are hurting around me. Now, if you could see my wife's face, she's smiling. If you could see her eyes, she's rolling her eyes and she's saying, no. And I'm telling you, my wife is wrong. In my heart, I believe I'm very compassionate. But I also believe if we evaluate our actions, in other words, here are all the hurting people that we've encountered in the last days, weeks, months, and here's the action we took. Did we stay in our comfort zone or did we actually demonstrate compassion toward those who were hurting? I'm sure that our score would not nearly be a 100, which is what I give myself for compassion toward the hurting. I think I score a 100. But but if I evaluate my actual actions, I'm guessing that my score wouldn't nearly be that high. That's the reason for my wife smiling and rolling her eyes. Now, here's the thing. Listen to me. This is such an important point. Jesus was fully human. Jesus is and always shall be fully God, but when he was born of a virgin, he became fully human. You know that's what we believe scripture teaches, right? Uh, the Bible tells us he was tempted in all points like as we. He grew in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man. Uh, the word tells us that he actually grew through that which he suffered. The idea of Jesus growing in any way, it, it just boggles my mind. But the Bible is emphatic. Jesus was fully human. And yet Jesus, time after time, found a way to push himself out of his comfort zone into demonstrating compassion for others. How did he do it? Uh, since he was fully human, I believe we can learn lessons from Jesus that we apply to our life. And here's the first lesson. If you really want to move out of your comfort zone into demonstrating compassion for someone who's hurting this next week, you've got to get this lesson in your mind. Number one, don't wait until you feel like helping the hurting before you help those who are hurting. See, by the time we get to Matthew chapter 14, verses 13 through 14, I'm about to try to build a case for you. I don't want you to get lost in me building a case and miss the point. The point is going to be this. By the time we get to our text, Jesus had to have been on empty. He had to have been depleted emotionally, mentally, physically, exhausted. 
He was making a beeline for his comfort zone, and yet there's some shape, form, or fashion way that Jesus, fully human, was able to step out of his comfort zone and demonstrate compassion toward those who are hurting. That's the point that I'm making, but I want you to see how depleted he was. If you have your Bible, open it to Matthew chapter 12, and we're just gonna do a very, very quick review. And I want you to notice in Matthew 12, why am I saying Jesus was depleted? Jesus was running on empty. Well, in Matthew chapter 12, he's attacked by the scribes and the Pharisees because he healed on the Sabbath. You know what he did that was so terrible? There was a man with a withered hand and Jesus healed the man with a withered hand. Withered hand. And, and, and the scribes and the Pharisees are criticizing him and they're condemning him. Never mind the fact that every scribe, every Pharisee who criticized Jesus, if their ox or their sheep fell into a ditch, they would stop and pull the ox out, the sheep out, and give it not even a second thought. But the idea of healing a human being, oh, that's anti-God. No way could you be the Messiah, Jesus, if you're gonna heal on the Sabbath day. You must be of the devil. And not only that, Matthew chapter 12, are you following along in the text? His critics accuse him of being in league with the devil, being in partnership with Satan himself. Why did they accuse him of that? Well, if you read in chapter 12, he heals a man who was demon possessed. The man was blind and the man was mute. Jesus casts out the demon. The guy can see and the guy can talk. And his critics accuse him, oh, we know how you did this. You didn't do it by the power of God. You did it by the power of Satan. Have you ever heard the phrase, no good deed goes unpunished? Isn't it emotionally depleting when you do good? You try to help somebody. I don't know, you heal somebody with a withered hand or, or goodness gracious, you cast out a demon or, or maybe something not quite so bold. You take somebody some food. You do something nice for somebody who's hurting and all you do, instead of getting applauded for it, encouraged for it, thanked for it, you just get criticized for it. You didn't do enough. You didn't do it soon enough. Uh, they didn't like this. They didn't like that. It just makes you want to throw up your hands and stay in your comfort zone and not ever help anyone ever again. And that's what Jesus is facing in Matthew chapter 12. But we're not finished with chapter 12. Then Jesus' family shows up. And trust me, in the Gospels, when Jesus' family shows up, it's never a good thing. It's never really presented in a positive light. You see, before the resurrection, Jesus' family didn't believe that he was the Messiah. As a matter of fact, Mark tells us on one occasion, and this may be the very occasion that Matthew is referring to, when his family showed up, they showed up because they thought he had lost his marbles. After all, he's claiming to be God. He's declaring, I am the bread of life. And you remember Moses says, God, who am I gonna say is sending me? And, and God says, you just tell them I am is sending you. And Jesus is running around saying, I am, I am, I am. Everybody knows what he's saying. He's saying he is God in the flesh and his family thinks that he's crazy. Listen to what Mark says. And when his family heard it, they went out to seize him for they were saying he's out of his mind. His family is showing up. And they're saying, we need to haul you back to Nazareth and put you in the psych ward because you need some help. Do you know how depleting it is, emotionally exhausting it is when you believe something and you're acting on something and your family mocks you and rejects you for what you believe? And then we make it to Matthew chapter 13 and notice how, uh, do you have your Bible open? Look at Matthew chapter 13 verse one. That same day, Matthew wants us to know that, that I'm not saying all of 12, 13 and 14 happen on the very same day, but it happens in this condensed period of time and Jesus has a whole lot that's coming out him. And so Jesus in Matthew 13 is teaching the crowds in parables and the people aren't getting it because he's teaching in parables. And trust me, as a preacher, as a teacher, whenever you're preaching or teaching and people are just looking at you like, <laughs> it's depleting, right? And even his disciples are going, Jesus, you know your sermons, you gotta, you gotta work on them because nobody understands the words you're saying, including us. What are you talking about, Jesus? But I also want you to see that he's just working from sun up till sun down. And then it's like in the evening, he's got a ton of other things to do. And, and all, all that we wanna do, remember he's fully human. All we wanna do when we're depleted is we wanna find our comfort zone and just veg in front of the TV or, or find our comfort zone and veg on the couch with the, some good mind candy, a book. 
But, but it, we're not finished. Then in Matthew 13, he goes to the synagogue in Nazareth, his hometown, and there his hometown folk reject him and scoff at him and mock him. So his family and his hometown... And it's emotionally depleting. And then we get to Matthew 14. And what's he hit with? Do you have your Bible? Look at it. He's hit with the death of John the Baptist. Now we know John the Baptist is relative, so we're gonna call him Cousin John. And Cousin John didn't just die. Cousin John is brutally murdered. It's emotionally depleting when we lose a family member. I've lost a mom. I've lost a dad. And I'm telling you, uh, that just knocks you for a loop. You lose somebody you love and he's lost his cousin and his cousin is not just his cousin but a co-worker in the ministry. John the Baptist baptized Jesus. John the Baptist lost his life for basically preaching Jesus. And now he's dead. And Jesus is grieving and he's depleted. And now... And now we come to verse 13. So check it out. In verse 13, it says, now when Jesus heard this, when Jesus heard what? When he heard his cousin John was dead, when Jesus heard this, he withdrew from there in a boat to a desolate place by himself. What's it telling you? It's telling you that Jesus is depleted and he's making a beeline to his comfort zone because he's fully human and he's running on empty. But look what it says next. He's headed to a desolate place by himself, but when the crowds heard it, they followed him on foot from the towns. When he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion on them, and he healed the sick. Jesus, fully human, had every right to say, guys, speak to the hand because the face don't care. I'm tired. My cousin was just murdered. I'm worried about my family. They're grieving. I'm running on empty. I've done enough for one day, one week, one month. It's somebody else's turn to take care of you. But it just ain't going to be me today. See, he could have retreated to his comfort zone, but instead he chose compassion. How in the world did Jesus in his humanity pull that off? I'll tell you, he didn't wait until he felt like helping the hurting before he helped the hurting. He just helped the hurting. In seminary, there's one professor and it just seemed kind of cold and callous at the time. But, but, man, I've come to realize the wisdom of what he said. He said, you know, when you do ministry, guys, you're going to get interrupted. You're going to be writing your sermon, or you're going to be preparing to teach a class, or you're going to be preparing for a, a staff meeting, or, or, or you're going to be trying to lead in this or that, and, and you're just going to be interrupted Somebody's going to call you with a crisis, a couple. Uh, there's going to be somebody that's headed to the hospital. There's going to be somebody you're discipling that's going through a crisis of faith. You're going to be hit with interruptions. And then he said this, and man, I've never forgotten these words. He said these exact words. I quote, the interruptions are your ministry. See, some of you are planners like me. Any of you like that? You've got your little phone, you got your little calendar, and you know when you're gonna do every single thing that day, when you're gonna drop the kids off, and when you're gonna, what you're gonna do for lunch, and you got it all, when you're gonna pick the kids up, your bedtime's bath, you got a slot for everything, and, and, and you just know that that's leading ultimately to a comfort zone where when everything is done, you're gonna collapse on the couch, watch TV, collapse on the couch, read a good book. You, you just, you've got that comfort zone. Zone. Anybody in here like me, that you, you're a planner, you got it all planned out? That's 10 per, it's not even 10%. There's like 10 of us. <laughs> the rest of y'all, what do you do? You just wing it? Like, I don't know what I'm doing today. I could not live my life that way. I, have, I, I tell my family, I don't have to make the plan, but I have to know the plan. What's the plan, right? 
And, and then what happens? An interruption comes along. And I'll tell you, I'll tell you what your comfort zone says. Your comfort zone says, keep going. Don't look. Turn a blind eye. Because if you stop and you deal with this interruption, guess what? You're going to get to your comfort zone late. Do you know what compassion says? Compassion says this interruption is my ministry. Compassion responds even in the unexpected moments. Compassion responds to the interruptions. Embrace interruptions as opportunities to demonstrate God's compassion for the hurting. How did Jesus pull off? Fully human. When he set foot on shore that day, how did he pull off stepping out of his comfort zone, which he was making a beeline to, to demonstrate compassion toward those who were hurting. Number one, he didn't wait until he felt like helping the hurting before he helped the hurting. And number two, and this is so important, you wanna do what Jesus did, you gotta follow your heart before you consult your head. Follow your heart. Where do I get that? Right out of the text. Did you notice how it says, he went ashore, he saw the crowd, he had compassion on them. Remember, fully human, he could have said, nope, no, 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 not gonna do this, but he didn't. He could have said, I'm heading to the comfort zone, I gotta spend a little time there. Uh, he could have said, man, I gotta go pray for my family, they're grieving the loss of my cousin. He could have said, I don't have time right now, but he didn't. How did he pull off stepping out of his comfort zone into demonstrating compassion for those who were hurting? I'll tell you, he didn't listen to his hands head, which probably offered him a thousand excuses, viable excuses for why he could turn a blind eye and make a beeline for his comfort zone. Instead of listening to his head, he listened to his heart. Did you know the word heart? It's, it's the idea of, of compassion. He says, he had compassion. Compassion is from the root word bowels. In the first century, they believed the bowels were the seat of emotions. And it's the same thing as saying heart today, except if you want to kind of judge one or the other, like first century, boy, they're dumb to call them bowels. And we're so smart to call them hearts, you know, it moved in your heart. No, no, no. Actually, they're wiser to call the bowels the seat of emotions. Because think about it, when something just really burdens you, you see hurt, you see pain. Uh, do, do you feel your heartache or do you honestly feel it in your gut? And you're just going, oh, that's awful. But we don't use bowels to express the seed of emotions because we have Valentine's Day. And, and Valentine's Day, we like to give a heart and say, I love you. It just wouldn't be the same to give somebody a card with a picture of our stomach on it and say, I stomach you. <laughs> or intestines and we'll just stop there. But Jesus followed his heart before his head could say anything. He saw their pain, their fear, their hunger. Now I could stop the sermon right here. I'm not going to. But I could stop it right here and just say, okay guys, there it is, there's the whole message. I've given you the message, here's the message. Jesus, follow Jesus, and Jesus leads you out of your comfort zone into showing compassion for those who are hurting around you. Do that this week. Oh, by the way, here's a couple of life hacks. Uh, you know, uh, don't, don't wait till you feel like it. And, and listen to your heart before you listen to your head. And the problem with just stopping right here and saying, man, 54 after, we've never dismissed that early. Merry Christmas. <laughs> the reason I'm not going to do that is because I'm afraid you'd just go, huh, okay, that was either good or bad or whatever. And I'm going to go, and you wouldn't do anything about this. So let me give you this encouragement, okay? I, I heard a sermon. Can't even remember what the sermon was. I'll never forget the title of the sermon. And the title of the sermon was this, do for one what you wish you could do for everyone. 
That's what I'm inviting you to do this week. Do for one what you wish you could do for everyone. See, when Jesus stepped off of that boat onto that shore, he was confronted by the crowd. The crowd is 5,000 men. The occasion is the feeding of the 5,000, right? And they're not even saying, I'm hungry. They're saying, I need to be healed. But it's not counting men and women. Uh, It's not counting, rather, women and children. And so conservative estimates put the number of the crowd at 15, 20, 25,000 people. Jesus looks at the crowd, and he's moved in his gut. And he says, they're hungry, they need to be healed. My comfort zone's gonna have to wait. But I'm not asking you to look at the needs of a thousand this week. I'm asking you to think not thousand, but one. Not the crowd, but one. And here's what I'm asking you to do. Do just what Jesus did when he stepped off of that boat this week. I want you to do this. See people. Jesus saw the crowd. I'm not asking you to see the crowd. You go, why, Gary? Because you're not Jesus. So just take a step. Do for one this week what you wish you could do for everyone. And I'm asking you, see people. Jesus saw the crowd. Look at people. Are they married? Are they single? Are they in school, out of school? What are they hoping for? What are they afraid of? And then don't just look and see people this week. Look for where they're hurting. Uh, Are they in a crisis? Did they just go through a breakup? Do they feel invisible? Do they feel like not a single soul on this planet cares for them? And then I'm inviting you to do something anything. Just step out of your comfort zone and do for one this week something what you wish you could do for everyone. And please don't wait till you feel like it. And please don't consult your head. Listen to your heart before you listen to your head because your head will give you a thousand good reasons why you can just turn a blind eye and keep going and head to your comfort zone. Now, if you'll do this, here's here's where I told you I was gonna end the sermon. If you will do this this week, if you'll do for one what you wish you could do for everyone, number one, you will fulfill your purpose. God said, when he was asked, you remember Jesus? Hey, Jesus, what's the greatest commandment? Jesus said the greatest commandment is that you love, here's a hint, help me out, love whom? God. All your heart. And he goes, Hey, the second commandment is this one. You want to summarize the whole scripture? Second commandment is this. First one, love God. The second one is love. Here's a hint. Help me out. Love others. Do you realize you are a lover of people? You go, no, 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 not me. Oh, if you're a child of God, you're a new creation and he's created you to love other people. And when you begin to love others, you step out of your comfort zone this week and you help someone who is hurting. You are living out of who you are. You are fulfilling the very purpose for which God created you, loving him and then loving others. But not only that, when you step out of your comfort zone and you begin to help those who are hurting, show compassion to those who are hurting, you will experience joy. You will experience abundant life. I want to give you a crazy, theologically messed up illustration. So just work with me and realize I'm just messed up as your pastor, okay? Here you go. You ready? Go back to the Garden of Gethsemane with me. Can you imagine... And hopefully the answer is no. You can't imagine this. I can't either. But let's let's just play like we can. Imagine in the Garden of Gethsemane, uh, Jesus says to the Father, the cross, really? That doesn't look very comfortable to me. So I'll tell you what, Not your will, but my will be done. I am not going to walk to the cross. I'm gonna walk away from the cross. But Father, I want you to know, I love you. I believe in you. I'm all in with you, Father. 
Would that have impacted the joy that Jesus experienced in the presence of his father? Would that have impacted uh, the intimacy that he experienced? Here is the reality. When we don't follow Jesus out of our comfort zone into compassion for those who are hurting, we start feeling uncomfortable in the presence of Jesus. And he's the one that we claim to follow. And he's the one that we claim that gives us peace and joy and hope. And that's the reason many of us don't experience it. Final point is this. If you step out of your comfort zone into helping those who are hurting this week, one, doing for one what you wish you could do for everyone, you will experience greater power and effectiveness. Jesus steps out of the boat onto the shore. He sees the crowd. He's moved in his gut. And he says, my comfort zone is gonna have to wait. And he responds to the needs of the hurting And think about what happened. The power of God showed up. And I'm telling you, countless lives were fed. Countless lives were healed. Countless lives were saved that day. How many people said, truly, this is the Son of God. This is the Messiah. How many people placed their trust in Jesus? If you want to see Jesus working, and you want to see his power moving, and you want to see lives being transformed, you're not going to see that from your comfort zone. You see that when you step out of the comfort zone into showing compassion for those who are hurting and God shows up and God begins to work miracles. Whether you're just taking food, whether you're stopping to pray for someone, whether you're giving someone a ride somewhere, whether you're giving someone money in a time of need, Whatever it is, I'm telling you, you will see the power of God at work. Final point is this. The most compassionate thing that Jesus has done for you is going to the cross and rising again from the grave, conquering sin, death, Satan, and hell. And by the way, apart from Christ, you and I are in a world of hurt because The wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Don't leave here today without taking advantage of what Jesus did for you. He stepped out of his comfort zone. He went to a cross. He died in your place. And here's the invitation. He invites you and me to repent of our sin, to repent of acting as if we are the king of kings and the king of our life, and to believe that Jesus is the rightful king. He is the Lord of lords, and then to follow him, to confess him as our King, our Lord, our Savior. If you've never done that, when I finish preaching, there'll be ministers right here at the next step room, this glass stand room, and we would love to tell you more about how you could turn your life over to Jesus. Or, I don't know, you could do what I did as a nine-year-old. You could just, you could just, uh, I was holding on to the back of a pew. Don't hold on to the chair in front of you because somebody will think you're messing with them. So just kind of do this. I don't know, just this. Just go, Lord, I don't want to go to hell. Will you say Save me. That's not bad either. But come and let us talk to you about that. Maybe if you want to know more about church membership, come back there. You want somebody to pray over you today, come back there to the next step room. Let us help you to take your next step with Jesus. Let me pray and we'll be dismissed. Lord Jesus, thank you for just showing us such remarkable compassion. When you stepped off the boat, you put your foot onto the shore. Instead of turning a blind eye, you saw the people. You were moved in your gut. And even though in your humanity, I can't imagine you felt like ignoring your comfort zone and diving into a world of need, you did so anyway because you listened to your heart, not your head. And in doing so, Lord Jesus, you've taught us how we can do that. So, Lord, today, my prayer is that every one of us really would do for one this week what we wish we could do for everyone. And when we do, Lord, would you remind us that we're fulfilling the purpose that you've given to us to love our neighbor? Would you let us experience joy in stepping out of our comfort zone into compassion for the hurting? And, Lord Jesus, would you let us see your power show up where you transform lives? Because we're willing to step out of our comfort zone and join you in showing compassion.
for those who are hurting. We pray this in Jesus' holy name. And all God's people said, amen. Hey, God bless you. You're dismissed. Have a great week.